Welcome to the It's About Time Writers Reading Series. Either, does anybody know the number? 372? Three? Ah! I didn't bring my notebook. I'm on vacation. So, from all different parts of uh, Seattle and the country, welcome to the continuing online version of the It's About Time Writers Reading Series, which is going for a new record in attendance. This meeting is being recorded. Your names will be uh, removed later for so that there is confidentiality other than that of the readers tonight. And later on, this recording will be uploaded to the It's About Time Writers Reading Series on its own YouTube channel. And a podcast will be available on the Seattle Public Library website can't tell you exactly when the podcast will be available, but this and um, recordings dating back to, I believe, last June or July 2020 are now available on the It's About Time uh, YouTube site. So if you've missed anything, you can go back and see a wonderful set of readings and surprises over the last year. Uh, tonight, I'm very happy to welcome uh, several people that I know personally and one I've never met before, but who became acquainted with one another in a, in a, a writing class quite some time ago. And I've actually already received some questions about it. <laughs> I get to do, oh, here's Pam Carter who may ask those questions herself. She emailed me earlier and she had some questions about your, your process. So I'm sure we all do. And that's one of the things that we're able to do is have a little interaction. Our first reader tonight is Millie, Millie Renfro. And she was born in Ellensburg, Washington, where she lived into her mid thirties. Her parents sang and read aloud to her and her siblings every day, stories, the funny papers and poem. And the family lived in several houses built by their father on small acreages, usually accompanied by willow windbreaks sheltering play areas from the Ellensburg winds that swept down the Cascades north of the Katatis, Kit, oh, I better let her say that, Kittitas Valley nearly every day. Her elementary school provided a rich curriculum of poetry, stories, plays, music, art, and PE nearly every day. Starting in high school, Millie studied creative writing and poetry with Miss Klobuchar, where she learned to write Japanese form haiku, which Millie has written ever since. After 30 years teaching elementary and middle school, Millie continued exploring poetry in the University of Washington Certificate Program, as well as in a variety of workshops in the Northwest. She's been an active participant in writers' groups for more than 40 years, has published several poems, and was an award winner at the Skagit Valley Poetry Festival several years ago. Welcome, Millie. Thank you so much. Good evening, and welcome to my reading. My poems reflect my experiences approaching 80, and my experiences caring for an 80-year-old woman. Poem. I live in a hollow place where the song that sings to me comes from the heater. How long have I been here? Oh, I think since last year when I became a lost woman at the edges of a worldwide pandemic caused by the coronavirus in a world that never can sing to me except when the heater is on. It seems pretty dreary Walls do not sing, floors remain treacherous, and I probably have forgotten what day it is and how to speak as well as how to sing to myself in these dark days alone for hours and hours at a time. I have yet to determine what day it is since this missile comes to me in the middle of the night after I lay awake for an hour and find no interest in the quiet of my bedroom, of my brain. I wonder if anyone has ever written such a dreary poem. Yet somewhere inside of me, the more I write, the more I am aware that I'm tickling those brain cells, wishing they would awaken. 
I know you are in there somewhere. Come to me for a little lavish poetry I haven't written in these 10 long months. Who could have known the rashness, the peppery flavor, the smelliness of a poem drugged from a sleeping brain? Just these short lines keep me writing. Who knew? When I finished writing, I thought, I remembered what year it is, 2020. But I have yet to remember today's date, December, it's only 4.30 a.m. Thank you for joining me. I'm rather pleased with this crazy thing I call poem. To her heart appealed, a shy little girl in the alfalfa field, her curiosity and wonder spilled into song, singing her stories to her heart appealed, and she hummed with the wind all the day long. Her curiosity and wonder spilled into song, the rustling of grasses, robins feathering their nest, and she hummed with the wind all the day long, though wheezing with asthma bound her for rest. The rustling of grasses, robins feathering their nests, a high airy melody above the wind's whistle, though wheezing from asthma bound her for rest. Her song squeezed to silence, words soft as a thistle. A high, airy melody above the wind's whistle, rhymes still dancing around in her head. Her song squeezed to silence, words soft as a thistle. No singer now, fledgling poet instead. Rhymes still dancing around in her head, stories and song to her heart appealed. No singer now, fledgling poet instead, a shy little girl in the alfalfa field. On approaching 80, 80, a speed parents caution you about in the first years of driving. 80 is a, long, a lot of money for a teenager longing to buy a wool tartan jacket hard-earned and long saved for, taking care of young neighbor children at 35 cents an hour. But the choice is hers. Any of 80 jackets on elegant racks in a women's clothiers, there were 28 more than 80 students in my graduating class in 1954. And now in two weeks, fewer than 20 women who have been friends for 75 years and counting, will meet for a two-night, three-day retreat at Suncadia, over the Cascades, near the community of, of, I know it starts with R, my mind a blank on this road to my 80th birthday, doesn't want to share with this poem at this time. Never a surprise, this happens frequently, and yet if I stop fussing, breathe deeply, slow my mind, sing a song that brings me joy, perhaps in five minutes or in 80, that long lost word will pop into my mind. I know it will, and yet I feel so cut off from this poem about Rosalind. And there it is, Rosalind. Mules of love, massive the burden this flesh must learn to bear like mules of love, from Ellen Bass. It is embarrassing, this getting old, getting, needing help, but from strangers I don't know, the days swing low and I am feeling cold. I pee my pants, my bowels I cannot hold. Will she wipe me? I weep to stop that flow. It is embarrassing, this getting old. Sweet sleep, oh, sleep away this life that holds me captive with this stranger, body in tow. Some days time slows, 
I feel a creeping cold. A house cries, bend, pick up this speck of mold. I bend, taste mold, unsteady, fall back, slow, embarrassed again, legs out of control. I pull the dresser scarf for help. She scolds, this aging body curled, arthritic fingers, toes. The days swing low. I dread the coming cold. The stranger cannot sing my heart in fold. And oh, I miss my dearest lost love so. It is embarrassing, this getting old. The days swing low and I am feeling cold. Farmer's Gift One, the minute I round the corner out of Bend, east of Powell Butte, the tart odor of junipers wrinkles my nose. I turn east on Neff Road, drive 15 miles into the high blue-gray desert. Just beyond the community church and the alfalfa store, the next mailbox, my cousin's 40 acres, a small farm for retired folks, acreage for alfalfa, pasture for a dozen beef cattle, four, four horses, five Welch ponies, no dogs greet me. A surprise, the front door is open, but no one, answers my hello. Uneasiness of a city woman hunches my spine. I sit on the porch, read my novel. A magpie worries the marrow of a neglected bone. Rufus-headed lark sparrows feed on the Russian sage beside me in the desert garden. An hour later, horses at the barn begin a nervous pacing. Hooves thud against stall walls, shrill nay, shiver the sky. From beyond the canal, behind the house, the talk of a hoof against stone, low voices. Two women ride out of a dust cloud, my cousin on her pony, her friend on the Palomino, cameras of the modern West. Two. Newly mown hay lies in long windrows, drying to available crisp in the fall sun. Late afternoon rain threatens, and we hightail it from the Ochoco's magnificent monument, Steen's Pillar, down through Prineville, back to Alfalfa. My cousin jumps on her four by four, races down to the drive, the track to drive the tractor pulling the baler, her emphysema got forgotten in the rising dust. A steady ka chunk, ka chunk, the rhythmic thump of bales hitting the chute beats the air as they drop. A row ahead of the crew, three dogs sniff the windrows for gophers, garter snakes, mice tails wagging like semaphores from eager sailors. Jumper prompts jaws and snap, bring up a mouse. He tears off to savor the catch. My cousin's husband and their neighbor buck the bales, swing each one up to the wagon where a second neighbor stacks. 123 bales dry as parchment, almost four tons, off to the barn in 45 minutes, rain foiled. Three, in the dusty orange of setting sun, a harrier hawk flashes his white rump patch as he dives, swoops up, talons gripping a small dinner tidbit. The moon, ruddy-faced, sunburnt, draped in dark blue-gray clouds, rises over the distant Ochoco Hills. We sit down to, the, to our dinner, fresh elk steak.
And my last poem is called Just Enough Light from Charles Zinnick. A coarse universe, unsolicited, divined as proper silence, we know no other. Gravity and light travel now, the phys physicists say, at the same speed. Are the two related? Reverberations shifting ever so slightly, or with a mighty shock from gravity to light, light to gravity, changing the image, recomposing the song. A clearer echo resounds, dances into magma, mountains rushing water, trees, blossoms, bacteria, viruses, mitochondria. And where are we in this fury undiscerned? How we shudder at the chasm, seemingly an endless void, yet conceive and cradle the infant who will write a new poem, wrap a rhythm that blazes into the night sky, raises old familial ways, blasts an abyss, filling with gravity and light, light and gravity, a poem only she can hear. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Millie. I've heard you You're read welcome. several times over the years, but you are you are looking so beautifully and unflinchingly at aging, you know, with a view on things. It's I'm so glad you're sharing that with us. Thank so, you. Um, we now get to have, uh, I forgot to announce earlier that if you are interested in doing an open mic reading, um, we have three minute open mic opportunities bet uh, between our readers. And one of the things that's been delightful about uh, the Zoom experience is that I've also said, if you're inviting your friends and family, why not invite your friends and family to read as well? So our first open mic reader, having very nicely switched seats with her mother, is Barb Renfro. Hi, I'm Barb Renfro Baker. Um, I have two poems tonight. Like my mom, I have taught uh, elementary school for 30 years as of next week excited about that and one of my favorite things to do is to help young children write poems poem makers in our classroom on a warm saturday i type the words connected by children who write about rocks and candy turtles and leaves deciphering the scrawls in their journals where they have edited and broken lines where i suggested in purple to preen a word here call a word there. Often they brandish a better idea, a stronger image than I could have wielded. Are they too young to count enough years to know of lost loves and those found? A phone call in dark sleep, the brain aneurysm in the mother-in-law I never knew, and the premature baby my friend cannot hold until his breath is strong. Yet these children weave words as if they had been breathing ideas all their precious lives. The poems of the ages dripping from their sticky fingers, heaping onto the plates of the poet laureates of the future. Where to Land for Judy. Your father bought the kit from an army surplus store in Portland before the war. Your mother didn't have a ring or a rug for the living room until their fifth anniversary when you were four. For years, he made you and your brothers, one sister, assemble the engine's gears, the bolts thick with grease, the maze of wires strewn across the side of the tool shed, the wings canvassed and strapped in layers of resin drying in your nostrils, then more resin, more canvas, always resin stiffening your jeans on Saturdays. When the plane was finished, you were not quite old enough to drive. The reward for tedious assembly, flying wherever you wanted, by yourself. Once you piloted your youngest brother across the mountains, 
singing Oh Susanna until the gas ran low. Without a radio while your brother cried, you had to decide where to put the plane down. There was a road and a field. Later, your dad wired you money for the gas and a motel, the sun already exchanged for mountain shadows. Now you must decide whether to keep your breasts or let them land on the field or the road before the genes that struck your women strike you in your plane like lightning. Thank you. What a delight to have you both read. You are not our first multi-generation set of readers, but it makes me think that we should make this an absolutely ongoing occasion. That was brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, our next reader is Maydell Quarry, and she was much more cryptic in her bio, but said that she basically, and we get to talk about this more later, how the three women who are we're hearing tonight met via UW Extension Certificate Writing Program in Poetry 1997 to 1998. Maydell retired 18 years ago as the secretary for a teaching and learning center at the University of Washington and now enjoys a rural lifestyle in Skykomish, gardening, coordinating monthly summer open air arts and crafts markets in the historic railroad town, and creating an occasional painting, and obviously also doing more writing than she refers to in her bio. Welcome, Medell. Okay, hello, and thank everybody for this occasion and for my newly Mary and Millie. Um, so many years we met together doing poetry. So, and we learn from a lot, from a mother so much. And um, really, really worked very, very, very hard. Um, so I will read um, my poems. Um, when you have gone, Will salmon from the sounds that feed into the sound that feel all the lost voices echoing on charged air, remarble riding in the thunder of colliding star clothes, raping the dropping the calculated bolt of the hearts of my pipes. People stalk up now. I don't know what's the, what's the rocking the cultivated hearts of my people, tamed now and shelter raised to fear the wild. Oh, Chinook, Hawkeye, Sinkeye, Coho, chums of many of many of many childhoods. My eyes must move south. To the fighting, style, fighting steel here, wild roan by rainbow, beckled brown, dugger, dolly marden trout, my father caught in five California strains well over a half a century ago. And oh, those cult fat catfish that lay in his field all day, gasping not dying, some kind of missing link that he poured into the sink when he got home and we watched them swim again until he gave the coup de gras and we ate them routed for supper. Oh, the soft half dry hatchery trout he caught later on in strong stock streams, never fought so well. Never hold the same thrill, never tasted cream. Oh. This poem is called Wicker Dreaming. I passed the shop with the fall, with the life-sized pupper weight, weight of wicker 
motorcycle in the window and each time the scene sets my mind's cupping, hunting, turning over as the perfectly shaped mock motor never will. Water woven wicker is romantic and frozen and light for summer furniture. Ladies dressing barrels, who had dreamed it into a motorcycle? I think of willow growing in marching, marshy places of the processes to prepare the twigs for bending or how a forked branch of it in the hands of a diviner finds water fully flowing underground, tells the farmer where to dig a well. Willow thickets rot, press down, pile up, evolve into peat bogs in a few million years. The Irish cut it into chunks and lay it out to dry. It burns smoky in the cottages of the poor. Write this on that stationary with a motorcycle, followed by a shimmer fueled by imagination. This poem Close to the cliff edge, above the sea, the farthest apple tree lay on her side, divided from the orchard by the pale of redrawn boundaries. A mound of sod covered her roots, exposed by a storm. So yes, and abundantly, yes, and abundantly, she bore sweet food. We walked up the trunk of the canted tree and reached her fruit without a ladder. The neighbor's children picked their fill and still through a lane autumn, we lived on bread and deep bowls of thick, fresh episodes. As we reverently ate, we took into the old tree story of a storm's uprooting and how she survived to bear hundreds of apples of a rare and wondrous flavor every year. This poem is about New District where I lived and worked. Collide. Ever so slowly this night, as I watch from my window, the falling snow filters through the grass. Chain, the chain turns it white. The changing sound of the traffic whoosh catches my ears. Flakes scarcely stick to the black street but I know it will be more white in the morning. On the steps of the campus square, a student sits in March sunshine, reading King Solomon's ring. I flash back to Lorenza's chapter on the jackdaws that came back to his attic each year, like Capistrano swallows how he named and knew the mated pairs, the easy way they greeted him, those welcome house guests homing in for an extended visit every spring. Sparrows chirp and scavenge in the alley where cafe tables spill in fair weather, where patrons sip exotic coffee, drop pastry comes, and chatter, a narrow ribbon out of the wind, no roof except the sky. If you are the artist Basquiat, you don't think about pleasing the eye. Your aim is to tell your hard story in fierce mark making, flashing strokes,
carrying more surging power than the blue lightning sparking from the overhead wires of Metro's electric buses. A, a gnarled old man, thin as a twig, bends down in the middle of the street, picks up as in a ritual, a little branch and a big golden leaf shaped like tobacco and moves them to the side of the room. By the espresso stand in the busy bookstore, a family rests on a bun bench. Mother runs her fingers through. Most mother runs her fingers sweetly through her daughter's hair. And out of thin air, I pull this moment. To capture a poem, peek around corners, across the gravel day-clear yard, a toddler drags a pterodactyl by the tail. Stand watch for these small clues, build trust, and sidle up obliquely. Wink the wild bird into your hand. at the Museum of Anthropology. The grandmother looked at the shaman's rattle in the glass case, marked the tiny deer hooves fastened around a twig hoop bound with straw hide and imagined clicking sounds, dancing fire lines, wailing harpoons and fish hooks, woven cover conical hats and baskets contrasted with a modern button blanket sharing images of raven with the cat in the hat filled up with spears canoes beautiful beadwork magnificent totem poles and their restless spirits she rested on a bench by a window that opened on a patch of ground vibrant with wildflowers, right with, with vibrant with wildflowers, native grasses, so alive in the now that it called her outside to find it. She stood in the natural garden with her daughter beside her felt the spirits of the ancestors hovering while thunder rolled and a dark squall gathered while the sky opened and an elemental wind blew patterns of green light through twirling leaves. A crow spoke on that charged air. Her heart and voice rose in reply. Yes, messenger, I hear. Your thank you, I thank you. White hard rain fought, washed the windshield and sunlight spit the clouds as the women took the scenic drive home along the, bay, the ocean. And this one, natural blessings. Wild seeds planted by the wind mantle the earth, feed the birds everywhere. Durer's drawing of a patch of meadow is as vibrant to me as his famous rabbit and praying hands. Great bushes of wild roses thrive by the ocean, their scent riding the breeze. Summer grasses sing from itty city cracks, their castle, castles back to bursting. Vacant lots shimmer with tansy buttons, dandelions, the dashed gent of flowers on the wild field pea vines that rip thin soil with lycurgin.
Purple fireweed begins, begins to be low, renew grown, burn ground, and children bring home from these exciting grounds Lunaria with her parchment moons. And my last poem, a formal poem called a pantoum. Ban Pan poom, pan tune for the elusive, with thanks to Antonio, Antonio Stradivari. I am drawn to what cannot be pinned down. The power and range of expressions that come only from Stradivari's violins. And modern science hadn't found the secret. The power and mange of expression call forth a rever reverential wonder, and modern science hasn't found the secret of the sounds that skilled musicians bummer, summon from a strand. Stall for call forth a referential wonder for this master craftsman who enabled the sounds that spilled musicians from and from a strad to make music down the centuries. For this master scrap craftsman who enabled through his art the power in the wood to make music down the centuries worked with an angel on his shoulder. Through his art, the power in the wood resounded, knowing, knowing Stradivari worked with an angel on his shoulder. And the wood and the angel conspired, resounded, knowing Stradivari freed the soul and the songs in the wood. And the wood and the angel conspired through Antonio's loving labor and field freed the soul and the songs in the wood that come only from Stradivarius violins through Antonio's loving labor. And I am drawn to what cannot be Thank you, Basil. Yeah. So, have we? Thank you so much. Have we had anyone else? If you are interested in doing the open mic, please let me know in the chat, and we will get to you. Um, and then, because we'll have a little time afterwards. But next, I'd like to introduce the third of our three M's, as I called you. And that is Miriam Basic. So Miriam, I have had the pleasure of, of working and writing with, and it's always a delight. Uh, haven't seen her nearly enough, so it's great to hear what she's been working on. Um, Miriam has been published in Snapdragon, Between the Lines, Poets West Literary Journal, and Three Elements Review. She was one of the featured poets in the digital portion of the Washington 129 Project, sponsored by Washington State Poet Laureate. As an avid journal writer, she has been charting the journey of living in these uncertain times with coronavirus impacting us all. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Peggy. I, I am deeply touched to see all my friends and family from the East Coast, from around here, um, my daughter. So it's, it's a very special reading and the chance to be together with Nadell and Millie. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out for this. It's really an honor for me to read with my poetry sisters. As, as uh, Peggy may have said, the three of us have been meeting for over 20 years to share friendship and poetry. So tonight what I'd like to do is to read a number of poems which I've written over the past year of COVID. Pandemic, 
April 9th, 2020. Some days are dark and heavy, too heavy to bear. Whatever lights there are, dim with uncertainty. All that is unknown is enough to let fear strike her match. The only antidote hope. But even she is a slippery mist of ill-defined future. We hold our breath, we stay home, we knit our brows, expect leadership to root us out of this mess. But Trump, the man at the top, is busy chewing gum, blowing empty bubbles. I walk almost every day in Lincoln Park in West Seattle, and these were my thoughts early on in the pandemic on one of those walks. Rule breakers. Yesterday at Lincoln Park, 15 or so rule breakers assembled under a picnic shelter, coffee cups in hand, warming by the wood fire, as if the world had turned a page, erased the demand for social distancing, not one of them wearing a mask. I had to still my teacher voice, which would have chided them for this get together. All over 60, all high risk. And yet, the connection is what counts, a force that overrides all rule mongering. This next short poem is a tribute to a father and his two sons out playing in that same park during COVID. War with the dragon. A father dances with the wind, two kites, one for each small child. They are careless, hoping the dragon will never find them. in search of safety. Enough of the primal pain of this time, enough of scarcity, of being stood up by sorrow or joy, enough of statistics, how they glow in the dark, infiltrate my dreams. Enough of fears, the way they bristle and implode, how they lead down dead ends, literally dead ends. Enough of long winters, closets with heavy overcoats. I seek sanctuary, safety, the sun, hammers to bang all the assault rifles into plowshares. This next one you'll have to forgive me for, it's pretty stereotyped and stereotypes I, I recognize only skim the surface, but, I, but it was a fun poem to write. Um, it's the difference between men's and women's programming and how it might relate to violence. Balls out. Men get a hard rap, too much responsibility. We send them out to, we send them out to war. They take the heat, the hurt, play ball even when injured. Don't cry, never cry, get up, fight like a man. It's all a confidence game, never to show weakness. Our grandson learned early to pick himself up from the pavement. Even when his knee is busted and bleeding, he says, I'm okay. Never to have the pleasure young girls do, playing jacks and paper dolls, sitting still while braiding each other's hair. Aggression and dominance become middle names for men, and they must like it like that. Revel in being top dog, the hero who can fix anything under your hood. Never to be stroked, oh, but we do stroke them. Massage their tight muscles, stroke egos, need them to be strong because we like to lean. What men miss is softness, surrender, being free to preen and prance. After years of tamping down tender feelings, 
something pent up blows like a steam valve, yearning for release. This one is something I imagine many of us may have felt after being vaccinated. Gratitude after vaccination, released from the fatal hammer of this virus, released to sing, hug, wander aimlessly through new doors now beginning to open. We bring our bucket of sadness, loneliness, unspent grief still lodged in cells, memory loops that unspool with worry. One year later, spring is here with its shaggy blossoms poking through. Aftermath. Hard to know what the clearing will reveal once this pandemic is over. Even fortune tellers lisp and grow blank. There are those futurists who make their living on prediction. I am not one of them. I picture a slow motion camera charting our waking from this bad dream, all at different moments. Some will remain quiet, reserve and sanctuary suit them. Others will tumble into travel, pursue what they have longed for all these many months. Still anxiety lingers, bedfellow with the unknown. I trust we will drift, each into our own future, scarred by a disease we could not control. Presently, we crawl toward more normalcy, whatever that means, return to hugs. Now switching from COVID on a completely different note, these next three poems are more family related. Why I hate raw tomatoes to this day. Something about the texture, the slime that enters the mouth without invitation, the potent burst of seeds, bloody orange skin stretched taut, belies the tendons and the stream of tiny corpuscles held by gelatin, not a friendly mix. My husband once thought it was the size of the tomato I objected to and offered me a grape tomato as if it were a pearl. He fully expected I would thank him for this palate extension. The surprise of crunchy tight skin releasing a burst of pulp was beyond the pale. And so it goes with hatreds that won't budge. Blank pages for Jeffrey. I like the toughness of some poets who with just a few lines of ink can tell their story. I like the blank page that gives me breath. I like your soft breathing in the night, the way your legs wrap mine so attentive to my restlessness and how you open the full page of your body for me to write on. Two birds. We watch the prelude to a winter storm, first snow of the season. White out skies seem to be waiting for some cue to empty, a white so dense it hurts. What we spy on our decks are two frozen birds. I want to cradle them in my hands to feel the pulsing of imagined heartbeats to warm their blood. Their stillness is alarming. I stop watching and will them to fly away. One does, but the remaining bird has now rolled over. Skeletal feet clutch emptiness. I ask my husband to move her to a soft place in the woods, now damp with snow and layers of leaves. It's warmer there. This last poem is what I see on my walks each morning. Driftwood on the beach at Lincoln Park. Forgotten logs, some stripped naked, 
Amber skin of madrona polished smooth. One tree takes the shape our fingers make in shadow puppets of lizards. I wink at him as I walk by. Then there are those with roots like honeycombs, a cluster of tendrils designed to drink deep. Picture cypress trees, but these go by a different name. They rest silent on a rocky beach, listening to the steady hum of waves folding in on themselves, heart and breath in sync. Someone carved native figures on a few of these fallen trees. Raven, salmon, they are speaking even now. Thank you guys, this has been a special treat for me. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to hear how your work has evolved. I just, you know, I'd love to steal that, uh, the open pages. What was your, your love? Blank, blank pages. Blank pages. Oh, beautiful. So I have a few questions, um, and then we'll hear, we have an open mic person, Laura. Um, so Pam wanted me to ask you, the three M's, have you given each other topics or prompts, assignments, and is your convening mostly critical or also generative? So, who wants to answer that? <laughs> Feel free to unmute and answer. I, um, it's it's a combination. We've done favorite poems. We've done. We usually submitted a poem in advance and would review it with each other, always in a really supportive. Um, response. And I think the most exciting project that we did that was especially exciting to Millie and Maydell is something called a Wrenchy, in which we took the last line of one poem and used that as the prompt for what we would write as our next poem. And what that generated is, because it wasn't a line that you would consider for yourself, it generated completely new and um, more imaginative than we might have come to ourselves. And have you always, like, have you met regularly all these years? We suspended a bit once Maydell moved to Skycomish. We were meeting in homes. We met at the university, at the student union. Um, and we suspended a bit, but courtesy of Millie's daughter, we've been meeting on Zoom probably once a month. And so that's been lovely. And I'll stop being the person who answers all the questions. Yeah, I, I can force somebody else to unmute. I like asked to unmute uh, with Maydell and Millie. So we have another question, although this one's for you, Miriam, which is a sort of maybe a bit insider. How has her life in West Seattle changed her poetry, if at all, versus other places she has lived? Although your last piece about walking in Lincoln Park uh, by Lincoln Park clearly answers that a little bit. So did your yeah, poetry change when you moved? It's been, I don't know how my poetry's changed, but it's been jarring as a difference from being a suburban person and really enjoying the controlled environment of Mill Creek to a much more chaotic urban setting, which I've never been used to, um, but I have the ocean. I, I've never been able to walk at the ocean every day, which is such a gift. And we get a light show. I've always wanted on my bucket list to see the aurora, but we get the aurora every night. You know, there's a different sunset or a different dawn. And I never had that experience in this, you know, where we used to live. That would be fun. I've yeah, it's pretty seen. exciting. How about you, Maydell? You also changed venues. How has that affected your work? Well, um, I would like to answer that question, but I don't really know. After uh, just about, I have a lot of rhyme and rhythm and natural choice of word. It was great, always with our, our um, meeting together and critiquing with grace 
each other's work and to meeting each time with a new form. But but um, I have kind of switched in the last 10 years. I haven't written so much poetry. My natural something or other isn't, it's different. It's just been too much. So instead I've done uh, painting. So I've been doing painting and uh, very much fewer poems. Um, but the painting is a wonderful process too. And so that's, that's been really nice. Mm -hmm. um, we did, I mean, like we met, we met so many times through the years for, for a good 20 years. And it was 97, 1997, when we uh, took the uh, creative writing in poetry uh, extension class at, um, at UW Extension. And so that was really uh, um, really a lovely amount of time together. Uh, you guys, did you have different teachers? Do you remember any of your teachers at the extension? I don't know if I remember all of them. Jan Wallace and um, Bill Randall. Oh, okay. Bill Randall. Mm -hmm. And there was one other one that I can't remember because we had three quarters and a different teacher each quarter and they were all wonderful. Okay. And, and Miriam, Miriam said, John, uh, you know. And question for Millie and Barb. So have you shared, I know, Barb, that you've heard your mom's work before. Do you share much of your work with her? I haven't done a lot of writing in the last few years myself. And so, no, I, I haven't shared with her. She was surprised when she heard I was going to do open mic. And stuff. <laughs> we, we like a few surprises. Well, it's yeah. lovely to hear you both. And I'm so glad you. that you're obviously so supportive of your mother's you know, long time writing and her, her sharing there. So yeah, she's a great, great model in that, the teaching and, and writing and art, all those things I tend to have followed in her footsteps a little bit. <laughs> Obviously. Well, and of course, as Millie, as you so often share in your bio, so now you've passed it along to just think not only to your daughter, but between you, almost 60 years worth of students that you've been encouraging in your poem making. Oh my God, you put it that way, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of poem making people. <laughs> that's quite wonderful. Um, I'm going to go now to uh, Laura, and you'll have to pronounce your own name, Laura. Laura Tarasov, she's going to be joining mm -hmm. us in August, and then we'll come back and after I stop the recording, We'll let people do a little chatting, just as though we were uh, in a milling around in a room <laughs> together. So, Laura, your open mic. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, and you did great, tear us off. Tear us it's off. A, just like it, just like it looks. Uh, so, my first poem tonight is called Supermoon, and uh, this was uh, published in Celestial Mus Musing. Poems inspired by the night sky. Um, eyes opening enough to see the light streaming through the edge of the Roman shade. So bright, I thought it was morning. The clock told me otherwise. I got out of bed to see what was causing this wonder. A faraway moon illuminating the clouds as they billowed by, concealing their light source. Cumulus pulled back, revealing a moon so huge and close, it seemed to have sped at light speed to peer into my window back at me. I stood for a moment, watching the clouds billowing like smoke from a factory, some dark, others gleaming in the moonlight with silver linings. And I wondered 
were you seeing this too? Or were you fast asleep, unaware of this magic? Are you my silver lining? I went back to my empty bed, filled with hope and wonder. One more. My true voice. So, uh, gosh, almost 11 years ago, I had a traumatic brain event. And um, over the course of several years, I have had, uh, I, I have learned the value of the term spells. I have had spells. It's a fantastic word that old ladies used to use all the time, and, and now I get to use it. So this is my true voice. I think about burning my old journals so that when I die, no one has to deal with them. So no one will read my weakest moments when they thought I was being so strong and good. Then I realize the, those words are, in fact, my truest feelings and actions. At the best and worst moments of my living, they show that I was struggling when people thought I was fine. They show that I was humbled when people thought I was proud. They show that I was brokenhearted when they thought I was healed. And I wondered, why hide those words from them when I die? Perhaps those words will inspire them to get through the next struggle. They will see I laughed when there was much to cry about. They will see I was proud when there was still much to be humbled by. They will see my healing when there was so much breaking my heart. A window into my heart, showing my truest self. And then I wondered, why am I waiting until I die? Thank you. I look forward to August. I look forward to July, but I look forward to August. <laughs> Thank you so that. much. Thank you. And actually, hearing that spells are a thing is, is helpful to me. As Carol Levin can attest, I personally haven't experienced TBI, but I've been too acquainted with it in my life. So um, our next reading is on, you know, I just looked it up and I promptly forgot it. So whatever is the next thing in July, I think it's like July 10th. And uh, the only way that we can top three M's is to allow seven writers. So <laughs> next month, I am pleased to be welcoming um, a group of, another group of writers that have been meeting together for quite a while. They, I read about them in the Seattle Times and they um, call themselves the Seven Writers Northwest. They have been particularly active um, in putting together their work. They're a longtime writing group, and with COVID, they uh, decided to create their own anthology and published it with the proceeds going to, uh, I believe, literary source. So we will be hearing from um, seven different writers, including Tyson Greer. Uh, let me see where I have my whole little breakdown here. Tyson Greer, Marianne Gonzalez, Wanda Herndon, Laura C. Lipman, Jane Spaulding, Suzanne Tedesco, and Beth Weir will be joining us in July. And then in August, as we mentioned, it will be Laura along with Marjorie Osterhout, who is doing an incredible thing, which is about um, kind of a live daily today in Salem about the Salem witchcraft trials. And spoiler alert, today was the first execution. So, and another young, um, uh, a younger uh, writer, shouldn't call her that, but she's not here tonight who I met when I was at a, a lovely Hedgebrook opportunity, who is working on an incredible series of essays together. So I hope you will all, uh, even if it's your first time here, always continue to come back and join us. And I'm now going to stop the recording so we can start chatting. Look forward to, um, if any of you missed it, 
or your friends weren't able to attend tonight, this will be available on the It's About Time Writers Reading Series YouTube channel and at a future point on the Seattle Public Library website in podcast version. Thank you all tonight.